Well, hello, everybody. This is Wes Moore. I'd like to welcome you to the third session of our macroeconomics course. In this session, we'll be talking about supply and demand, two very important principles of economics, whether you're taking microeconomics or macroeconomics. So let's turn our attention now to what we want to review in this session. There are four things that we want to talk about in our time together today. Uh, the first is the law of demand. Then we want to talk about the law of supply. Thirdly, we want to bring these together and look at supply and demand in markets. When people come together to buy, how do, does supply and demand work? And then finally, we want to talk about something very important called the rationing effect of price. The rationing effect of price. Why is it good sometimes that prices go up? So let's start off then with the law of demand, the law of demand. First of all, what is demand? When we say demand in, a, in an economics sense, what do we mean? Well, demand is simply the quantity of a product that customers are both willing and able to buy at a certain price. It is how much the consumer is willing to take off the market by paying a price for it. And when we look at demand, we always look at demand at different price points. How, how much of a product does a customer want, or do customers in general want of a product at a certain price level? And this leads us to what we call the law of demand, the law of demand. This is a rule we find when we're talking about customers and the quantity of products that they uh, desire. And the law of demand simply is that the quantity demanded goes up when the price goes down and goes down when the price goes up. There is an inverse relationship between the quantity that customers want and the price. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you think about it yourself, you are going to want to buy more of something if it costs us less and less of something if it costs more. And really the reason for this in terms of in the broad sense is the whole idea of scarcity that we talked about in a previous session, that resources are scarce. My resources are scarce as a consumer. I only have so much money. So therefore, if your price is higher on the product, I will buy less of it because I have a scarce resource and that is my income. So scarcity really drives the whole law of demand. Now let's look at trying to picture and understand uh, demand graphically and in a chart form. Let's look at that. We call this the demand schedule and the demand curve. A demand schedule is just an estimate of what how much consumers would want at a certain price level. Take this uh, table here for example. We have different price points. We have, and these are hot dogs, so we're just talking about hot dogs. How many hot dogs would be wanted in a month at a certain price level? And we see we have Prices per hot dog here, $5, $4, $3, $2, $1. And then we have the qu quantity demanded at those prices. And you can see at $5, for example, there are 5 million, and this is all just made up, but there would be 5 million hot dogs demanded by consumers at that price. But if you dropped it to 4, there would be 10. And at 2, you'd have 20, and at 1, you'd have 25. You can see that inverse relationship. Well, normally you don't see demand schedules too much. You normally will see demand charts or graphs. So you will see what we call the demand curve. And that is simply a plotting of the price and quantities that we see in the demand schedule on a graph with two axes. We have an X and a Y. So let's, I'm going to go to another slide here and we'll zoom in. Let's take a better look at this demand curve. And you see here, Let's try and get my cursor over here so I can show you some things. You see we have a demand curve. Now it's called a curve, but usually for uh, ease of understanding we just make it straight. But most of the time that would curve. Anyway, we've got here at $5, we've got the, that's the price. We've got the demand of 5 million units or 5 million hot dogs. You see that's the same as in the chart or in the table. So here we got 4 and we've got down to 10, we've got 2 and we've got over to 20. So this is just plotting the relationship between price and quantity demanded. So if you were to get a question that was, 
how many hot dogs will be demanded given the following demand curve at three dollars you would just look for three dollars you would go over to the point where that intersects the demand curve and you would go down and you would see that that is uh, the number of hot dogs that are demanded so let's let's before we leave this let's talk about something a distinction that is important the distinction between quantity demanded and demand itself quantity demanded is simply the quantity on this demand curve that is required for every price that's the quantity demanded the demand itself is the whole curve so when we talk about demand demand can sh can shift left or right depending on how consumers view things and we're going to talk about now what kinds of things will change what shifts demand let's look at that let's try and understand what would move the curve but quantity demanded quantity demanded is just the quantity on a specific curve the demand itself is the whole curve moving left or right on this chart so let's look then at what can change uh, demand let's look at that there are a number of things that can change demand that can shift that curve left or right we're just going to hit three of them briefly. The first is consumer income. The more money people make, the more they would want at every price. So let's say that you had the $5, the $5 hot dog, and we had 5 million hot dogs demanded at $5. But if you got a 20% raise, you may go to the grocery store or go to the ball game, and you might buy two hot dogs instead of one because you have more money. So that consumer income can shift the curve towards the right which is, is increased demand or it can shift it to the left with decreased demand in in the times that we're living in when uh, unemployment is high people have less money so even at five dollars or at three dollars or at two dollars they're going to buy fewer hot dogs than they would otherwise another thing that can shift the demand curve is the price of other things so there are two uh, two things that you have to keep in mind uh, when you're talking about a specific product and what can change its demand curve. The price of other things. Number one, the price of substitute products. Price of products that can be used in place of them. For example, hot dogs, it's easy to see how a substitute, something that could be used in place of a hot dog, would be a hamburger. So if hamburger prices dropped uh, by half, say for example, then you would expect to see the demand curve for hot dogs move to the left to less demand but if you saw the price of uh, ground beef or hamburger go up by 20 or 30 percent then you would expect the uh, demand curve for hot dogs to shift to the right in other words more would be demanded at each price and I hope that makes sense to you but there's another thing called a complement a complementary product is a product that can be used with the product that you're talking about so for example uh, hot dog buns let's just say hot dog buns if hot dog bun prices dropped that may cause people to go ahead and buy more hot dogs because the buns are cheaper and it's the reverse also if hot dog prices go down because buns are a complement it's used with them then you would expect bun demand uh, to go up so when things change that are related to that item either a substitute or complement the demand sh curve can shift one way or the other. And then finally, the expectations that consumers have about the future. The expectations of what their income might be and the expectations of what prices might be. So for example, if I expected that I I'm going to be laid off next year, then I would probably not buy as much. My demand would go down. And if enough of the consumers in the market felt that way, then the total demand would shift. Or if I expected prices, let's say that I expected prices of hamburger to go up next year. I may go ahead and buy more hot dogs now, uh, or in the case of hamburger, if we were talking about hamburgers on the curve, I may go ahead and buy more now, and that would shift the curve, and it would change in the following year when the demand, when the prices went up and the demand went down. So the point is expectations of consumers can affect and move the whole demand curve. But remember, that's not quantity demanded, that's the whole demand curve itself. 
Now let's move on and talk about the law of supply. And it's, it's very similar. It's basically just the reverse of the law of demand. The law of supply is that basically, well, supply itself, not skip ahead too far, supply is the quantity of a product that producers are willing and able to supply at each price. So in demand, we've got what the consumers are willing and able to buy at each price. But with supply, we've got what the producers are willing and able to supply at each price. And the demand of uh, the supply curve, the law of supply, is that the supply demand it goes up when price goes up and down when price goes down. It's directly related. It's not inversely related. And this will make sense too because if, if I'm a producer of hot dogs and I can get $5 for a hot dog, I'm going to make a lot more hot dogs than if I can only get $2. So that's a very easy to understand relationship. That's called the law of supply. Now let's look at the supply schedule and the supply curve. Again, this is very easy to understand. We've got prices of hot dogs and then we've got this quantity supplied. And we can see that it's the reverse of the demand. I've got five dollars for hot dogs and I want to supply 25 million. But if you take me down to one dollar a hot dog, then I only want to supply five. And this is what the supply curve would look like. You see, it's the reverse. And let's take a little bit closer look at that as well. You can see here that we've got the prices on the left just like before and we've got a line going up starting at the bottom left to right it goes up that's because if I can make more per hot dog I as a producer am willing to supply more that's where the five dollars beats the 25 million hot dogs and so on so that's pretty easy to understand we don't need to spend a lot of time on that just like with uh, demand Quantity supplied is different from the quantity. Quantity, is, quantity supplied refers to what is on this demand curve. I, I will supply 25 million at $5, but I will only supply 10 million at $2. That's quanti quantity supplied. But supply itself is the entire curve, the entire curve. And so we want to ask now, what would it take to shift that entire curve, left or right? Again, we'll just look at three things, and they're easy to understand. First of all, I would supply more at a given price if my technology improves, which allows me to make more product at the same or a lower price. So in other words, if, if I needed $5 per hot dog to pr provide $25 million, and I had better technology to come along and help me make more hot dogs faster at a cheaper cost, I might be able to... Uh, are willing to supply 30 million or 35 million hot dogs at five dollars because the technology has helped me get my cost down. So costs become a big issue with suppliers and of course with demand and consumers uh, price is important to them. What else? Resource prices. Again we're talking about cost. If one of the ingredients in making a hot dog was reduced by 30 percent then my cost would go down and I would still I would be able to make more hot dogs at that price and still make a good profit so the whole supply curve could shift it could shift forward or it could shift backwards if the price of a resource went up then I would supply fewer hot dogs at that price because my costs would go up so remember this all goes back to rational self-interest doesn't it this producer is going to supply more if he can make more that's rational that makes sense and it's in his best interest. But a consumer, if the price goes up, the consumer is going to say that's too much. Rationally, I'm going to buy less. That's in my self-interest. So that's why we said early on that rational self-interest is so important to understanding why all of this happens the way that it does. And then finally, expectations. The same kind of expectations. Do I expect the economy to be better next year? Do I expect prices to go down, my, my costs to go up, do I expect you know, th there to be uh, some unknown event, some chaos that's coming that I expect might happen. Expectations uh, are very important with both supply and demand curves. Now let's put these together. This won't take long. Let's put these together and let's look at what happens in a market. Let's look. See, now we, we're going to overlay 
both the supply and the demand curves for hot dogs on one chart. So we've got supply is blue, that's going up. We've got demand is orange, and that's going down. And you can see there is a relationship here, and we see this crossing point. So let's, let's uh, look at a couple of things. Let's consider a couple of things. First of all, markets are where buyers and sellers come together. It doesn't do any good to have a demand but no supply. And it doesn't do any good to have a supply but no demand. A market is where both of these come together uh, so that people can receive the goods that they need and suppliers can sell those goods and make a profit. So let's look at a couple of things here, first of all. Let's look and see what happens if there is a surplus. Let's say that today the market for hot dogs, the prices for, hot, for a hot dog were $4. All right, at $4, let's say you went to Walmart and everywhere you could go, you found hot dogs for $4. Well, what would happen here is we look at this uh, supply and demand curve. At $4, Suppliers are going to want to provide, they're making 20 million hot dogs. But the demand at four is only for 10 million. So when the price is too high, we have too much supply and too little demand, and that creates a surplus. That means extra. Well, what happens there? What happens is these producers, they end up with a whole bunch of extra hot dogs sitting there and their sales are not coming through. So they recognize that their prices are too high, so they begin to lower their prices. And as they lower their prices, the demand increases until hopefully they get to this point. We'll talk about that last. But let's talk about something, uh, the reverse. Let's say that the price was $2. You go to Walmart everywhere around the country and the price is about $2. Well, at $2, the supplier doesn't want to make that much. He's only making 10 million hot dogs at $2. It's just not worth it for him. Remember, rational self-interest. But of course, the consumer, he's like, wow, well, if you're going to sell them for $2, then I'll buy them all up. That's, so the demand is high. The demand is for 20 million. Here we have too much demand and too little supply. Customers want to buy more, but there is not any more available. So we have what's called a shortage. In a shortage situation, the uh, sellers realize that their supply is going off the shelves very, very quickly. So they start to raise their prices. And as they raise their prices, demand starts to back up until you get to this point again. And what is that point? That point is called equilibrium. Equilibrium is when there is a balance between what consumers want and what suppliers are willing to supply. And this, uh, this is a very important. You notice that we have the free actions of people here. We have the free actions of suppliers changing the supply as they recognize what the market is doing. We have the free actions of consumers changing their buying habits as uh, they see changes in the market as well. This equilibrium will tend to balance out over time. You'll see prices go up, you'll see prices go down, but eventually they will balance out and you will have the right amount of, of supply and the right amount of uh, demand. That is what happens in a free market. What happens when the government gets involved, and this is important, when the government gets involved and artificially sets prices, let's say that the government sets the price of hot dogs at $4. Well, it doesn't change the fact that the consumer is not going to want to buy that many hot dogs at $4. So you end up, when the government sets a price, you end up with a surplus. You have stuff sitting around and it wastes. But if the government sets a price too low, then you have a shortage because they're wanting, there's a, a desire for more here, but there's only a supply here. Take the example of prescription medication. And we're going to talk in a moment about the uh, rationing effect of price. But take prescription drugs. Let's say that the government sets a price of $2 for a pill that normally sells for $3 in the market. What is going to happen? You say, well, we'll get cheaper pills. You will get cheaper pills, 
but you'll also use them up so fast that there will be a shortage because the supplier is just not going to make as many pills at two dollars as he will at three. The only choice the government would have then was to go in and force the supplier to make them. And that's what we talked about earlier about when the government begins to take more of the economy over when they start dictating more of the elements that the market should be dictating then the government has to exercise more and more control to force it to happen. So government intervention is not a good thing in the market. It tends to create surpluses or shortages. But now let's talk about something as we're talking about price and we're talking about what price uh, will do. We see that price changes quantity supplied, price changes quantity demanded, and we see that price really has an effect on uh, what people get what they buy, what they don't buy, what they have uh, to supply, and so on. Let's look at this thing called the rationing effect of price. And I want you to imagine it's July the 4th weekend, and I want to pose a question to you that may shock you a little bit. Why is it good that gas prices go up on July the 4th weekend? You notice that when it comes to a big travel holiday like July the 4th weekend, prices tend to go up prices of gas tend to go up. Why is it good that prices go up on July the 4th weekend? Let me show you here why this is true. Imagine that you and your family are going to take a vacation. You've planned all year and you've saved all year to go to the beach, a big beach trip. You're going to drive down to Florida and have a whole week at the beach. And um, gas, gas companies set the price too low that week. And let's say instead of it being $2 a gallon, they drop it down to a dollar a gallon on July the 2nd. Well, you get a little bit of a late start on the 3rd. You're getting ready to leave for your holiday week. And you pull into the, to the, the gas station and you're so excited and all your kids and all your family are with you and you're ready to go. And you jump out of the car to fill up your gas and there's no gas in the pump. There's just a big sign that says, out of gas what happened? Well, what happened is the price was set too low. Remember we talked about this. When the price is too low, people buy too much, even if they don't really want it. So when gas prices go up on the holiday weekend, the reason that it's good that they go up is because they keep people from buying gas who otherwise would not buy it. You see, the guy sitting at home on the weekend, if the gas is two fifty, three dollars a gallon, he's not going to get up and go fill up. He's going to wait till the prices to go down. But if it's a buck, everybody and their brother is going to run to the gas station and fill up everything that they can. So if prices are too low, there would be no gas for your trip because people would take more than they really needed. Higher prices mean only people who really want gas will buy it. Everybody else will wait for the price to go down. So this is called the rationing effect of price. And ration means to restrict or limit. When gas prices go up on the holiday weekend, they tend to make sure that the quantity that is there is sufficient for people who really need it. But if you had it too low, you would lose. The gas would be gone so quickly, no one would have it. It's a very important part of price, of, of maintaining the supply of things, is that prices go up when demand goes up so that we can ma maintain supply. You say, well, Wes, that could mean that people could raise gas prices to 8 or $10 a gallon. Well, the, the weakness in that argument is that there's only a, so much they can raise it because of rational self-interest. Let's say that Exxon raised it to two twenty-five, but Sitgo raised it to 4 bucks. Well, the guy that goes to Sitgo is going to go, hey, that's too much. Right across the street, it's 250 And he's going to go over there and buy it for 250 Now, even it, though it's higher at 250 it's not $4. So competition in the market tends to limit how high prices can go, even on those uh, high-demand weekends and high-demand times. So that's the rationing effect of price, and it's very important for you to understand. All right, that's session three of understanding uh, supply and demand, macroeconomics. Look forward to seeing you again at our next lesson. Have a great day.